Hello there, everyone, and thank you for rejoining me here in you know, The Last Days of Robert Kennedy. Well, maybe not, but um, we're here, of course, in uh, Asia, trying to get rid of uh, enemies of America, basically. And we're here in Africa, of course, getting rid of enemies of America as well. Um, our GDP is looking pretty okay. Not great. But our debt is looking pretty decent. But into the jaws of democracy. It's been a long and grueling work to get to this point, but we can finally say with no small amount of pride that the Civil Rights Act has officially reached the Senate. Small victory, and we saw the miles of uh, the winding halls of bureaucracy to guide our bill through, but it's a victory nonetheless. No time to celebrate, though, because a new bill is firmly in the gaping maw of American Democratic Republicanism. In order to debut on the Senate floor, will the bill must pass the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is currently headed by one James Oliver Eastland, a bona fide card carrying rapid segregationist. Under normal circumstances, we might just let him have his way and delay the bill in perpetuity. We don't rock the boat too much, but these are not normal circumstances. Civil Rights Act. Must be made in a law of these the United States are to continue to call themselves defending freedom, equality, and true democracy of the, in the dark and fevered dream of the world. As such, it is necessary that we get this bill passed. Eastland and on to the Senate floor. What options should we pursue? Eastland cannot be avoided. Send it to the committee. Which I kind of don't like this whole civil rights thing that you cannot see. Like all every single other bill that you can do, like so many senators might vote for it or might not. That the not knowing what happened, I just do the not German's like very choice. Much. It was a tough choice sending the civil rights act off to Easton's committee, but it may have been the right call in the end. He is, as to be expected, pulling out all stops to prevent the bill from leaving committee and tearing holes in the bill wherever it can. But he's taking a break from being a professional belligerent ape to make us an offer. Eastland will actually let the bill through the Judiciary Committee if we adjust the bill a bit more to his liking. While we would obviously prefer the bill to stay as complete, Eastland's alterations aren't as extreme as one might expect. Then we can act it certainly, but it will be a major win for our civil rights and a clear framework for future legislation. Plus, it would be obviously get us out on the Senate floor. That said, Eastland's alterations came with more downsides than just a weakened act. A weaker act means less Republican support, and the actual fight on the Senate floor will end up in a rhetorical battle with the psalm stock trench warfare, but there's always a threat of a filibuster. Do we take Eastland up on his offer? Gosh darn it, we will not yield another inch, as we're still trying to do this as well. It's looking okay for the progressive pack. No, even better for the nationalists, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, we're just campaigning there. Um, campaign up here, too. We'll see what happens. Um, as we're still, like I said, just literally a second ago. Like, just a second ago, too. Uh, we're still trying to do everything we can up here, too. So. Still trying to get all the way to Stanleyville and whatnot and end that god dang war. The Magnolia kickback. In one of the most recent meetings with Eason, in between all the races, by all another nonsense, of course, that great day actually said something quite interesting. He said that he would let the Civil Rights Act in its unedited entirety onto the Senate floor. Since he believes that any senator with half a brain will shut this BS down as soon as he goes to vote. It's not entirely a so-called good faith offer. Eason expect that if he does this for now, or if he goes against every moral and logical fiber of my being for you on American sissies, we owe him some unspecified favor. The very least you can do is make for making me break my own moral code. The possibility of us owing Eason a favor is honestly a terrifying one. Who knows what he'll cash it in for? That said, what other option do we have? This act is too, so much bigger than us. We'll have to cave in to Eastland for the sake of liberty and freedom. What can harm can a favor do anyways? Flip a complex, don't really care. Oh, 14, oh, once a month, ain't bad. Increase Ionite's pact by 1, 1.25. I'd rather increase ours. Ours are going to increase no matter what. Even though we're really far down, as long as it keeps going on for now, we'll be okay. Keep pushing through, keep pushing through. One last push. The act's debut, Johnson's plan went off without a hitch, and a little loophole is being tied up as we speak. We shut the Civil Rights Act clear through the Judiciary Committee and right on the Senate floor. Johnson just goes to show that there's so, still such a thing as a good Republican, one who's willing to work across party lines for what's best for the American people. Unfortunately, we're right about pissing off the Nationals. Easton and Thurman have been spending what seems like every waking moment complaining to the press. But now, every single thing we do is a tyrannic, tyrannic scandal, unseen since the time of Benedict Arnold. In any case, we aren't counting the Nationals' vote anyways. The bell's on the floor, but it's not quite time for it to go to vote. All we can do now is court a few more votes and pray that the National Caucus is in filibuster. Fingers crossed, this is a new dawn for America. Come on, I want to see what's going on with this. It's not under smoke and mirrors either, which sucks, but whatever. As we're still trying to get Italy in the open as well, so. It's all a giant freaking mess. That's pretty much all this is turned out to, which is most of life, actually. Hey, that's good, though. Because if we don't get it passed, we're kind of screwed on this campaign. And no one wants to get screwed on the campaign. Well, in certain avenues and stuff, but whatever. Uh, i got some comments to go through as well, but we'll get to that in a little bit, as long as I remember. Uh, we win the issue. Good. Nice. Firmly in our sphere for now. Or, where are they going? Sure, why not? Please just do not lose there. Nice. One last push. 
We're probably not going to pass in all honesty. I might use the consequence for it. Because we just don't have the votes for it, you know? Shoot a railway guns? Why not? Oh, a walking wing surprise. As soon as Silver Rides get the cinema floor, everyone tents up for obvious and inevitable filibuster, most likely from Thurman and his ilk. Thing is, however, that filibuster never came. That said, move on to voting procedure very soon, all without a hitch. A big win, not just for us, but for the American people. We can focus on directly securing votes and general preparing for the final vote on the act. While well, scrambling to react to some absurd 24 hour long filibuster, then that means we have a much better chance of passing the Civil Rights Act. We're therefore ever closer to reaching that perfect American shrine of the Constitution, of course. A land where all are equal and free, judged by the content of uh, action and content of ideas, not a color of skin. Silver so attack is very far from being a done deal, and yet we can't put our feet up and pat ourselves on the back. We can't ever be breathe a sigh of relief that we have to jump on the road on the road to a free, fair America. Looks like Strom knows where to, when to shut up. Silver so attack, oh boy. Final vote. Jesus Christ. So I read that one last time, too. I'm going to invest in your increase influence. There we go. Um, root of the issue. The Civil Rights Act has helped come out of the land, hopefully. And laymen uh, alike are celebrating their victory. Despite the bellicose rhetoric tinged with a southern twang aimed at the righteousness of her cause, millions of dollars spent on defaming and harassing her leading figures in humble rank and file. And cut off a broadcast meant to turn the American public against us, despite aggressive assaults from cankerous, hateful racists, 20 million Americans cannot truly exercise the right which we take for granted. But the struggle for true quality is yet to be won. The obstacles remain for the colored man to hurdle, one which has centuries uh, to entrench themselves into the American system. Invisible or otherwise, they pervade and corrupt the very institutions which proclaim to deliver liberty and justice for all. For now, we shall revel in the seminal. Uh, victory, a moment in America's history. Uh, let's take care now. We're not to grow complacent in our laurels as last we see our current success undone. Uh, if you want to do this, please go ahead. Is that French? Yeah, it's French. I've read that one definitely before, so. Oh boy. Final vote. Voted on the Civil Rights Act has not been days, weeks, or months in the making. It's not been years or even decades in the making. The Civil Rights Act has been generations coming. It's been coming since the first slave ship landed on the shores of Virginia. It's a bill that's been on the unsung, has been sung on the plantations and the colored only meeting halls. It's a bill that rode the underground railroads. It's a bill that forget, fought and died at Gettysburg, waving the ban of the Union and, and of abolitionism. Abs abolitionism. It's a bill that marched with Martin Luther King and his quarter million demanding freedom and equality under American law. We now stand on the precipice of a new era of American history. The new era will surely be one of Amer true American patriotism. A nation coming together to celebrate a commitment to freedom, equality, and brotherhood. Because are we not all Americans? Are we not all deserving of the same opportunities and rights? If the league passes act, we we'll one more thing that, we'll ne that they will never have in Germania. We'll have a nation united and working tirelessly towards a true free democracy. And I promise you, this democracy will always win in the end. Now we'll just have to hope that the Senate agrees. It only takes 51 years. Sunrise in Birmingham. The sun rose over the house of a young black family in Birmingham. They all suddenly taking the radio to the room up the night previous, and I accidentally left it on. From it came the voice of RFK, my fellow Americans. I come to you today to speak to you of a new era of Americanism. Earlier today, the United States Senate voted narrowly to pass the Civil Rights Act. Wow! And it's now sitting here right on my desk, ready for me to sign. I want to take the time to explain to you what this new act will do after I sign it. The act will secure a solid, equal choice for Americans, regardless of race, color, or creed. We finally shoved Jim Crow with his one foot in the grave entirely into the said grave, and we're not stopping here. The radio woke the boy from his fitful sleep. He jolted from his dream of white hoods and burning crosses into the Birmingham bedroom. The golden sun was flowing through the blinds in his window, filling his room with a bright yellow hue. A sleepy, dark-skinned hand reached to turn the radio dial. By in 63, I stood in this very same spot to tell you all of this. I had a dream. A dream of an America where I knew I was soon to come. An America where we were all Americans, not white Americans or black Americans. I stand here today to tell you that we were ever close to that dream. Even now, President Kennedy signing into law the Civil Rights Act. The very act that will build the foundation for America of which I dream. Again, that same sleepy dream hand reached out and turned the dial. And now the change is going to come uh, by Sam Cooke. Now for the weather. Well, the beautiful sunrise over Birmingham. You can expect warm sunny days ahead. Today, expect high of. That sleepy hand reached the dial once more. And this time, to turn it off. The boy pulled on his shoes, stood up and went outside and went out at the sunrise. We did it all for you. Look at that. See more liberal. Then increase the status of civil rights. Um, the rights of African American systems prove over time. Nice. Huh, we got it. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Justice prospers where rightly guided laws are duly enforced and adhered to all by all. Um, conversely, uh, improperly applied laws which liberate are as dangerous as properly applied laws which apply us, for the former demonstrates the government's incapacity to dispense justice whenever needed. Justice requires cooperation between both intent and practice, depriving one the other, tyrants blossom with a good man up. Thus cannot be said, gain said, that every injustice heard is to have occurred in this supposed land of freedom is a threat to the very freedoms it enshrined as a law and the justice which they should cultivate, with charity for all though. America is by far the wealthiest, most prosperous, and free nation on the planet. While Germany continues to flounder desperately trying to preserve its empire of evil, and Japan perpetually stamps the boot down upon its oppressed peoples, we continue to stand tall as a beginning of liberty and prosperity. 
And yet there are still pockets of people within our nation without the means to live. They struggle to put food on the table. They struggle to find legal counsel where they have been wronged. They live in the most squalid and dire conditions imaginable. And allowing this to happen to our own people, how can we call ourselves any better than the fascists? Robert Kennedy intends to rectify the situation with immediate effect, with a range of measures aimed at granting aid and welfare to the most vulnerable. Which would be great, great, great. Who are the cause? Oh boy. Civil Rights Act. I can't believe we actually passed it. Like, I, I, was, I was thinking it would not pass. Like, in all honesty, I did not think it would. They're still trying to fight down here, too, and we don't get any supply for some reason, too, which is not very good for us, but whatever. We'll train some new divisions as well. But we'll run see. through the jungle. <clears throat> Pouring himself a scotch, President Kennedy read read the report from this man named Abidjan. Open the few tattered remains of the Third French Republic. As if Africa wasn't suffering enough, the fragile peace in the western half of the continent was, as of today, shattered as war broke out between the French and their allies and the Cameroonian socialists. A few years ago, can even pass after the arrival of American troops in South Africa, before another crisis enveloped the continent, of course. And as much as the pacifists and the bad actors and the RDs would rail against support, you'd have to intervene. Without American intervention, the whole of Western Africa would follow a rising tide of revolutionary socialism, and the French and anemic colonial army had little hope of standing in its way. Getting amused over the issue, his feet up on the resolute desk as he listened to the late night rain pattering against the windows of the Oval Office, the scumbags on his party's right wing would have a field day with him. The progressives sending more troops to fight blacks, but what choice was there? It was this, or lose Africa to a government only a shade away from outright communism. Perhaps it could spin as America protecting its Hulu colony of Liberia, or valiantly stepping in to save their once allies in the Second World War. Like everything else in politics, there was no easy answer, of course. He was resolved to do what he knew what to do was right. Intervention was necessary, and Africa divided between the fascist Italians, the Nazis, and a bunch of Reds was in the future he was interested in seeing. As the president reached for the phone, it began ringing, and wearily picked it up, already knowing that his wife would be on the other end, asking when to be coming to bed. Soon, honey, soon. Um, more information. West African War. Uh, release the Baron. Escalate it. Screw it. Who cares? Increase our uh, advantage. Yes. Show equipment. Sending stuff. Yes. Still trying to get Italy, in, of course, with us as well. Um, smoke and mirrors. Not so much. Still working on this too. I hope England doesn't win because that would suck for us, but whatever. Um, research. We are trying to finish up pigeons and whatnot because we love pigeons. The road towards justice. Also, this is where we say, um, equal uh, the forces of the right and injustice in America currently see the president is equal to any other president, which means he's not going to get assassinated. So, uh, I like, like I said in the last episode, we are using consequence here. Um, I, I don't want to get assassinated. I want to see what power we can go with this. So, uh, yeah. There's a man straddling the ba balance. It was a conservative, huh? Uh, let's open this one back up. Smoke and mirrors. This is what tell us. State of the Supreme Court. Moderately conservative? Well, we can make it liberal next. Towards the root of the issue. Today, President RFK has spoken to the nation about the Civil Rights Act has been that he had been instrumental in passing. Uh, <clears throat> Upon walking to the podium on the stage of the Capitol building, is applauded by the supporters in the audience, and once applauded stop, he began his speech, of course. My fellow Americans, we have all united behind or around the concept of freedom in a way that I can never have thought possible. The passage of the Civil Rights Act is an extraordinary step forward for all of us, but today our struggles are not over. While the equality we strive for has been outcodified, we must maintain our commitment to the downturn across America and refuse to withdraw into complacency, unfortunately. We must still co come to terms with the root of the issue. Across the country, the remains, uh, there are remnants of prejudice, we continue to falter, many undebated by the legislation we have passed. Uh, while the blatant and ugly efforts of the states to segregate the races of America have been dashed, the echoes from earlier times have nonetheless persisted. To many of these institutions are a fact of life, for good or ill, but our nation was not founded on the principles espoused by America's founders. I call on all citizens of the United States to look at ourselves and our society critically, and question some of the things we take for granted. The un-American attitudes of racist groups have lost their stranglehold on politics, but that does not mean they have been vanquished for good. Confronting these uncomfortable aspects will not be comfortable or enjoyable, but it's something we must do as a nation if we ever plan on moving forward. Only through examination can we make our country safe and living, inviting place for all Americans. Thank you all. We will persevere. With charity for all, which I don't remember if I read it or not. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to read this, please go ahead again. So. Nomination Thurgood Marshall. In a press conference that dominated headlines across country today, President RFK has announced that Thurgood Marshall, currently judging the U.S. Supreme Court of Appeals, or U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, we nominated to a newly vacated seat on the Supreme Court. Marshall, a graduate of Howard Law School and experienced civil rights litigator, will be the first African American to serve on the highest court in the land. This appointment would surely mark a turning point in American history, but some of Congress are not so willing to see such a point turn in the first place. Many senators come from the South and are directly relying on white voter blocks who aren't well disposed towards putting a black man on the Supreme Court. Several members of the Senate have already put out statements to press examining their firm opposition. Although nobody's come out and said it would be due to Marshall's race instead, of course. 
Uh, the really this is mentioned the dangers of liberal judicial activism and other such phrases. Clearly, the appointment of Thurgood Marshall will be a political fight for the ages. The right thing, the right time, the right man, the right place. I hope. Tour of the nation. Robert Kennedy is not content uh, to be seen as yet another career politician sitting in an ivory tower. He needs the people to know that he truly cares for them and he wants to understand the issues that they really face. To them, the president's plan on embarking a grand tour across the whole of the United States where he'll visit numerous communities and peoples from all walks of life. He uses this opportunity to speak directly to the American people and get a view from the ground of the problems affecting their everyday life. This should hopefully foster a better relationship between the office of the president and the people of that the office dedicated to self serving. A new day over Africa. The new surrounding. The outcome of the South African War had been reported on the TVs all day, but when it was announced that President Kennedy was making a national address, millions gathered around their TVs, eagerly waiting to hear what he had been say here to say. The student and smiling president sat in the Oval Office, exuding, exuding, and here it comes as he faced uh, the camera directly before finally speaking. Uh, my fellow Americans, he said, I am pleased to share with you the news that the last pockets of organized German resistance in Africa have collapsed, and their leader's dead, captured fled. We defeated the Africa shield, and with it, the shadow over the continent has been lifted. We are victorious, and the South African War is over. Uh, where crowds gathered to watch you address the broken into cheers and celebrations as a crowd across the country began. There were many reasons to celebrate the victory, not just for democracy, but by dealing a significant blow to the, Germany, the Germans and fascism across the world. Uh, to prevent uh, the continent from falling into anarchy, Kennedy continued the organization of free nations that began the process of establishing mandates in the continent, which will exist to transition the continent to democracies and to prevent unnecessary power vacuums of violence. For decades, Africa has suffered, Kennedy finished, under uh, the Reich and under colonialism. We'll work to repair this magnitude of damage the president paused. <clears throat> We successfully defeated the German menace, but our work to better the world continues. A new day shines over Africa, and for that I thank every and every American citizen and serviceman who made this possible. God bless you, may God bless America. So 40, 52. Senate confirmation. So that's 40, 47, 52. Very good. We need more uh, progressive senators here, but you know, whatever. Uh, Trump in South Africa. It is official. Africa is free. The organization of free nations emerged victorious in spite against the Africa shield, crushing three Nazi Iraq commissariats that tried to tear a democratic South Africa apart and expand the fascist ideology over all of Africa. President RFK spoke to the nation for the Oval Office to announce a victory, of course, and that America's brave boys will be returning home as soon as humanly possible. Even as the first charter flight, uh, or Pan Am flight, such down airports across the eastern seaboards, crowds of thousands filled terminals and parking lots, waving flags, singing the national anthem, and cheering heartwarming scenes of tired soldiers hugging and kissing their young wives and children. Snapped by photographers to be shared in the newspapers and preserve for eternity. The Secretary of Defense announced plans to hold a military parade in Washington, D.C. to honor the returned veterans that saved the continent from barbarity and slavery. With the defeat of the Nazis in Africa, now comes a long and tough work to rebuild half the continent for a bright and democratic future. War crimes trials will be held to try the captured SS and Wehrmacht soldiers, as well as their border regulars that caused so much death and destruction. Now, new nations will be set up to allow the people of Africa to make their own destiny. A full support are built by American money and technical expertise. And of course, millions of people, former slaves, war amputees, orphans, the hungry and sick will have to be cared for in Africa, as well as our own troops who have been seen bloody battles and gruesome deeds that few believe humans are capable of. But is, uh, that is tomorrow's job. And today we celebrate the victory over Nazism, and that our brave men and women are coming home. The Dark Continent is no more. Trust in government increased by a large amount. Service manpower for government depletion decreased by 1%. South African war victory. Um, if you're worried about this, please go ahead. I love the one Central African state. Keep mandates to three separate mandates. That's really the way to go for all that. Um, I went over here. Do we win here yet? Oh, we've not. Our guys are just kind of hanging out. So after the African mandates. Um, if you wonder about this, please go ahead. Duty calls. I do want to do all this stuff too eventually sometime, so we'll see. But uh, duty calls from Washington, D.C. Oh boy. Work towards crushing the world in East Africa, promoting liberalism. I'll go with that one. Scale back troop commitments. Nope. We go need some serious command power. Provide economic aid. That's fine. Offer administrative support. That's fine too. Italy chooses your future. Uh, over the past few weeks, the both OF and Cold Prosperity Sphere were entangled in a bitter fight over the heart of the most beautiful maiden of Europe, the sweet Italian Empire. Tears were shed, bouquets, and goblins were thrown, but in the end, both suitors received this cold shoulder for now. What? The lady just isn't ready to commit yet, so she, no, she needs some time to find herself in a forward path for a while. The decision to abstain from choosing a side may not be unexpected, as initially assumed. Both the Cold Prosperity Sphere and the OF seem extraordinarily interested in bringing Italy to their side, so holding out my move. Move one of the two sides to come up with a better deal. A few love triangles end up with a clear winner, but this one might just be a result in Italy getting the upper hand. This thing she's Japanese. What the heck, man? Bruh. If anything, we just want. Honestly, we're pretty good on everything. There you go. 
I don't know. Bruh, what do you mean? Oh, I mean that just that was just for that one. Okay. South Africa, West Africa. How's it how are they looking? Well, they're still struggling all over the place here. Solid campaigns, nice. We definitely do co until pro. Hey, it's a good firm. A man who wants to clear that you do what is, you think is right and let the law catch up. One of the most important judicial institution in the United States. And test the vice vote in the Senate today. Third of good marshals confirms the new associate judge of the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Marshall will be the first African American to serve in the court, and his confirmation is undoubtedly a victory for the civil rights movement, which he himself has worked tirelessly to advance. And there's a confirmation hearing. A number of conservative senators rallied against judicial activism and has made a variety of statements that many commentators have called little better than dog whistles. Some even asked whether or not Marshall has ties to American Bolsheviks. The strategy failed, though. At a press conference today, George Justice Marshall stated his gratitude to the Senate and the people of America for posting for pictures with his two sons and his wife, the civil rights activist C. Celia. Uh, so yeah, Marshall, that's truly a historic moment for the nation, representing the triumph of justice over institutional racism. Let's hope so anyways. And of course, with this one, charity for all, get more stability, journey of a thousand miles, and justice every anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, we read that one earlier, too. We grow a little more unified, which would be nice, and we did get rid of the all everything down here, we still can do that stuff up there, too, which is fine. Um, and un-American culture, un-American institutions, unjust justice, build a safety net, it's going to cost a lot more, poverty gets better though, testimony for the people, Bobby's done during the nation. Capital Hill by necessity knows more about the true state of the union than its own people, however it's not a mission. The knowledge with which bases and policies relies on a complicated hierarchy of departments, agencies, and offices. All of them are staffed with their own employees and uh, managers, and humans can air and possess their own agendas as Nixon attests. President Kennedy's ambitious road trip provides us with an opportunity to learn more about the American people's plot than tabulation sheets processed in D.C. Let's give our planners more information for the administration's reforms. Additionally, it allows us to offer them the government's tangible presence to reach out and soothe their worries of being left The journey of a again. thousand miles. Robert Kennedy sat in the Oval Office. Wilbur Guy and Will James w Rowley, Secret Service Director of Crossroom. So, everything all set? Yes, Mr. President, replied Rowley. All your bags and necessary items are on board, Air Force One, and everything is secure for a smooth running of things while you're on your campaign. Excellent, said the president, standing up for the Resolute Desk. Just, now is just a decision where to start. Wait, said Guy, I thought we had agreed upon Boston for first destination to shore up our sport and stronghold of ours. What's changed? Kennedy scratched his chin. Well, you see, I'm not sure that's the best course of action right now. I think we need to focus more on the party unity, but traveling more conservative strongholds. Our sports in Boston aren't going anywhere. I think of Maine. Guy sighed. It's your call, Bob, but everyone's already set up for Boston. You're the boss, but I still think that would be the best choice. Kennedy looked out of the window over the White House lawn, and it was a terrific call. Uh, terrif terrifically beautiful today. One good for flying, he suppose. He had been set on Maine, but now he wasn't sure where to fly to. Boston? Or rural voters? Trim or liberal? Um. Well. Honestly, it doesn't really matter. I've done Boston. I'm pretty sure I've done Boston before. Let's go to Maine. I want to go to Maine. Um. I think, I think I've done Boston before. I could be wrong, but whatever. Uh, just justice. Um. America, as we've come to realize, is a land of towering contrast as much as a land of towering skylines. We preach the word of freedom, but also keep freedom away from the swaths of our people. We preach exercise and God-given right to vote, but we also keep the right away from those who we deem unworthy of voting. So do we bluster and boast of the liberties we supposedly cherish, but in the same breath order judges and sheriffs have snuffed the opportunity to cherish liberty for a great many Americans? We've come to a government and seen the injustice that received in the sinews, and have rightly decided that this state of affairs cannot stand. What is unjust must be set just at last. Towards this, uh, we must turn our stern gaze to the lawman who had overseen the affection of unjust laws. The Portland Speech. The Portland, Maine was a funny little town. Barely 65,000 people lived here, but it was still the largest town. Uh, and it saved by quite a large margin. The motorcade drive from the airport had been rather short, only riding for a few miles to the Fort Allen Park, where President Robert Kennedy stood for always to give a speech. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, people of Maine, before I begin, I'd like to say how much I am thankful for having such a warm reception in your city. I say that the two largest wings of the National Progressive Pact have been reasonably amiable towards each other for as long as they have ex existed. How now, however, some party leaders say the time for debate is over. I'm glad and agreed. Now it's time to unite. You unite with the Progressives, unite with the Republicans and Democrats, unite with our co cousins to the north and those across the sea. On a lot of you, America has been many enemies at home and abroad. There are those who would like to, some who would like to see back and change on account of the color of the skin. There are those who would love seeing your nation reduced to ashes on the kind of freedom-loving ways. I will say this, shall not come to pass. We are freedom-loving people, and we will keep our brothers free. Bobby stepped off the stage, a mediocre round of applause going up behind him. Not exactly my best work, he said, turning towards William Guy, but it was half improved, improvised anyway. What do you say to a crowd as quiet as this? Where's next? Where's next? Oh, Guy shrugged. Chicago or Detroit? 
Let's go to Detroit. And we have a little command power. Prediction, 5-7, not bad. Um, let's go to here. Great Plains. They're great. What else are we doing here? So we have West Africa. We have the African Mandates. I was going to save a command power to do one of these. Boost ability by 5%. Yeah. Oh. Pull out of Africa. Yeah, we need to save a command power for all this stuff. So West Africa. Kind of screwed. You know, they look to be doing okay. And Indonesian Civil War is still going. For now. Come on for now. Yes. Do that pretty easily. It'll choose their future. This is an interest Japanese. There's that one. I didn't we're not investing as much because we are running out of political power now too. So But they're really leaning towards us, so. Detroit speech. See Detroit not growing larger, more grand following the war. Many homes in the front found their way uh, from the airport like destitute or abandoned. The population. A poor blacks that had moved to the city scared away most of the wealthier whites. Crime was growing rampant and the city growing close to all our iron care more than one occasion. Class inequality was real here. And if Bobby Kane was getting this crowd to follow him, he had to address it. Ladies and gentlemen of Detroit, I'm honestly I'm humbled by the warm uh, welcome, I received in your city. Detroit is a lovely place with a deep history, great industry, and long running institutions. That's something anyone can be proud of, however. It, like so many other cities in America, is polluted with a stain. A stain that runs deep and draws a sand in the line that I almost obey. I, of course, speak of segregation. It ought to be possible for students of any color to attend any school so they choose without military support. It ought to be possible for customers of any color to buy any service so they choose without demonstrating in the street. It ought to be possible, I think, for people of any color to choose whatever seat they please in their bus without fear of giving it up. It ought to be possible, I think, for any American to enjoy the privileges of being an American without regard for the race of color. As such, I will not bow down to those who cherish or wish for the separation of the races, for they are separate, we are not, they are not equal. Can he step off, down off the stage, a round of furious applause going up behind him? Not bad, he said to William Guy, who had, uh, who had given his own speech not five minutes ago. Guy nodded, where's the next? See, United, Yellowstone, Denver. Yellowstone would be nice. Um, it would really get time in the National Park, but Denver would be nice. Let's go and kind of go to Denver. It joins the free world. Uh, Italian-American communities all across the United States today have erupted in celebration as if Italy officially signed the, uh, the legislation to join the organization Free Nations as a member, despite immense Japanese pressure. This is really the time people have struck a valiant blow in the OFN's efforts to contain the dual menaces of the INX Pact and the J J Japanese Coal Prosperity Sphere. The OFN has gained an important foothold in Europe, access to the Suez Canal, access to some of the world's largest oil reserves in the Middle East. While the Cold War is so slightly, is still far from one, there's still a widespread feeling among the population that things may finally be looking up for the forces of the free world. Another shining light in the sea of darkness. Nice. Beautiful. A Rass's prison sentence. Uh, one look at the prison tallies and registers across country reveal a dark, stark pattern. Colored men, predominantly from the ghettos and gutters of the sprawling cities, feeling more than itself with them whites. Another look at the records, loitering and petty thievery, minor brawls, sentenced by verdicts and with half decades beyond the dank and fetid walls of the Great Bar Hotel. Five times more, by the time the black man leaves the rusted iron chains of prison, the court of public opinion will have judged him guilty again. And so they will remain paupers left with no choice but to break the law once more for their own sakes. Misjustice indeed, yet it is misjustice intolerated best, and worth encouraged for decades wherever the heavy hand of the laws reach. We must address this. Oh, oh we're still here too. Uh, let's close out of this one. The Rocky Mountain High. Oh, we still do this as well. God dang it. Um, 30. 30.7, not bad. I want to spend the command power for this, but... Uh, we're so close. 36. Just give us one more month and we'll be in the lead. If we're not in the lead, then I will just do something funky then. Mm, I don't want to kill the Republicans and Democrats, though, because we need them in 68. Road to justice. Also, these all, also all opened up. Equal to any other president, we're champions of social justice. Um, I want to do all this stuff, but as I said, we don't have any Well, we have some political power, but I need to save it just in case, maybe. A less liberal campaign for civil rights. Campaign for Wa with Wallace. Got the gold water. Fight against poverty. I like this one a lot. We get a little more debt, which is not good. We get more stability, which is okay, which we don't really need. The poverty, we can improve. We get more inflation, but we get more growth. Campaign where we haven't. So, academic base begins to improve as well. I'm going to do this one. Because I don't want to keep doing that. Rocky Mountain High. Denver, Colorado was one of the fastest growing cities in America in the past 15 years. Its population increased by nearly a quarter. Due to the dismay of many less welcoming Americans, it have increased to a manageable manner disagreeable to them, with many new residents being of Latino persuasion. <clears throat> the Chicano movement has a strong foothold here and can provide a strong foothold for the progressives in Colorado once on the steps of the ca state capitol. President Robert Kennedy stood before thousands of people speaking him. People of Denver and all my fellow Americans had come out today to give a speech of fancy terminology, but to state a fact. At the core of the American society, there's a disease, an un inborn illness that we un 
uh, willingly accept as a social norm when it is clear to see that it weakens us terribly. I, of course, speak of the policies of segregation and state sponsored racism. I see people of different colors and creeds standing before me today, white, black, Hispanic, Asian. Do all those affected by racism? I say that your fight is not forgotten. Civil rights are not limited just to the African American communities, since all peoples of all colors who have been discriminated against by our twisted system. There are many individuals who have had to remind us of that. In particular, I would say Cesar Chavez, a man of whom I owe great respect. There are people, of course, countless others who have contributed to the struggle. <clears throat> But the struggle itself is not over, so we must stand together regardless of color and demand that we be judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. I and my friends among the progressives will ensure that such righteous demands do not fall upon deaf ears. Thank you. After another hour of on and off speaking about and shaking hands, Robert Kennedy got back into the jet black Lincoln Continental that served as the head of the presidential motorcade. He turned to William Guy, who sat beside him. That took a bit longer than expected. I decided we're going to Washington next. Seattle, specifically. Diverse place, replied Guy. You've been winging most of these speeches so far. What are you going to talk about? Civil rights. <clears throat> Labor unions. Leadership approval of the nationals causes to decrease, decrease by 8%. Civil rights. Urban voters. Urban voters. Labor unions. Why not? Dinner Seattle. The restaurant. Uh, Phil's had a fancy aura than the name would suggest. Of course, half the place has been reserved ahead of time for the president's entourage of Secret Service agents and politicians. William, President William, uh, President Kennedy sat himself in a cozy little corner table with William Guy eating a steak after a long day of pleasantries and speeches. Well, all things considered, said Robert Kennedy, cutting a piece of filet mignon, I say it went pretty well. I'm not sure how poorly it could have gone in the first place, considering how well we pull here, but every single talking point hit the nail on the head. People out here love every minute of the speech. Sure, replied Guy, I think that we all sit out there, we should help us out a bit in Washington, and at least prevent, pre prevent us from losing the state as a whole, so uh, what's next after we finish a nice little dinner? We got the rest of the West Coast to cover us in California. Oregon. Probably California. Uh, I always, I always, do I always in California? Oregon. Let's go to Oregon. Screw it. Cicero's nightmare. <clears throat> the Constitution promises justice to all, but any fool can see that is a falsehood. The grinding machinery of justice crumbles or crushes. Many undeserving of punishment through its unstoppable gears, cruelly and unjustly ruining the lives of thousands of Americans after every year. Like so many of America's institutions, our courts are entertaining as corrupt as any despots. Like so many things in America, the courts are worse for blacks. African Americans, though deserving of the same rights as any other American, are subjected to endless humiliation and poor treatment every day, and when they fight back, they're, they're ground through the courts like the lowest common criminal. It is your duty to scour the taint and corruption from courts to provide fair and equal justice to every American, no matter who they are, but, like all of our reforms, it won't be easy. To start with, we should establish a committee to scrutinize court practices across the nation and identify the blight so we might not so we might tear it out. And justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Let's support artillery. Runs for democracy. Huh. No, I don't need to do that. That's getting very low. I'm getting worried about that. Peacekeeping, 5%. We're almost there. Scientists flock to Africa. Oh. Well, that's cool. We're about that, please go ahead. Uh, Portlandia. RFK had come to Portland after uh, quite a fashion of speeches across America, so it was no surprise to find a large crowd of expectant faces waiting him in the Mount Tabor Park. These people lived right on the doorstep of the Japanese ports in the Pacific Ocean and were obviously eagerly anticipating some anti-Japanese rhetoric. <clears throat> Bobby Kennedy shuffled his papers on the podium and began to speak. People of Portland, I see you among many of my expected faces. <clears throat> Excuse me, of course. The West Coast is faced with the greatest and most troubling humiliation and anger from the Japanese treaty ports brought about by the now void Akagi Accords. Many of the industrial sectors are under duress and with such difficult times upon us recently, there's no one of the main line of American politicians have failed you in, in leadership. I can promise you that the National Progressive Pact at your side of the city of Portland, the city of Oregon, and the entirety of the West Coast will be brought out these difficult times, unsullied by pain and scarf of poverty. Kennedy could continue with and without a speech notes, simply giving a run of the mill speech to please his overall masses. These past few weeks must have been hell on the writers, and the most recent ones really needed spicing up. In any case, people seem to love it as they always have. After an hour or so of off and on speaking in Mount Tabor, Bob again once again hopped in hopped his Black Lincoln Continental of the presidential motorcade with the Vice President Guy alongside him. Well, Big Gang Guy, we couldn't get a Go, couldn't go along the West Coast without hitting California, now could we? No, we couldn't, Hugh, replied Kennedy. I've got two drafts for speech in San Francisco. I think it would do folks on civil rights. <clears throat> labor unions? <clears throat> sure, why not? We'll do lab the labor unions. 66, looking good there. Um, no, we're fine there. Artillery, yes. Come on, look at the debt and whatnot. Here we go, expand training missions. 5%, 5%, 5%. This one is not bad either. Uh, which was by 1.5%, which is not good. There's no point needed to do this, because we're not they're not attacking anybody, so this one probably do better. 
you go. Let's jump out a little bit. Uh, over here, California ports. When you were standing up on the stage, and just outright called the Japanese ports a criminal illegal occupation of American soil, I just thought about the world stood still for a minute. Bob again he smiled as Vice President William Guy from across the dinner table. So, still can't believe any politician would say something like that, huh? I'm hardly the first to spit on the Kagi courts. Well, it just so happens few and far between is all, saying that you got a lot of support anyhow. I'm not sure if I've ever seen a crowd erupt like that. I loved you, Bobby. Kenny looked, took another slice out of his steak, eating while talking. Yeah, well, he said, I guess that means a little adventure here was a success. Now I think we're headed to Texas. Observe court practices. Laws well, coming many may come in from Congress, <clears throat> but it is the court which interprets their letter and spirit. Owing to this, the men and women who extensively study America's labyrinthian set of laws effectively decide how laws will look like to the American people. Should Congress and court come at odds with one another, a situation will undoubtedly arise where any laws the former conceive will diverge significantly in wording by the time the nation's laws enforcement receive the memorandums. There exists no better instance of this phenomenon than the extent the legal systems of our southern states. Manned by Dixiecrats and the sympathizers, courts of the law from North Carolina to Texas have long had a free hand impeding the implementation of civil rights laws within their jurisdictions. Sitting through their archives of verdicts and rulings is unfortunately a burden we cannot do without, at least from where, from there. Kickstarting the dismantlement of Jim Crow is as simple as replacing the powder wigs, apparently keeping it aloft. You know, we get to enough political power every day, still not enough. Yellow Rose. Which city in Texas to visit gave RFK's advisors quite the argument? Some said Houston for his Greek population, some recommended San Antonio for a trip to the Alamo. Some called for Austin for its place as a state capital. Bobby himself eventually had to intervene, deciding to visit Austin. On the steps of the Texas capital, thousands of people of all races looked on. Besides Kennedy stood Lyndon Baines Johnson, the famous Texan politician and the former opponent of the RFK's presidential run. People of Austin, before I begin, I want to thank you all for the warm, work warm welcome I've ever received. Not only from your city, but also your leaders. I, of course, speak of the man besides me, LBJ, one who I greatly respect. In divided times, such as we find ourselves in presently, it's easy to see only the name of the party, and not the name of the man who follows it. It's easy to dismiss someone as other because of the party line. However, I say that a man is loyal to his own convictions, and as such, should not be judged upon the party which he decides. I see the actions and policies of a congress congressman, Lyndon Johnson, and I'm moved and inspired by them. He's fought for the torch of civil rights as much as any progressive, so why should I not call him a friend? The actions of LBJ reflect the whole of the state of Texas, and they will not go unnoticed nor unappreciated. The only way that we can achieve true equality in this great nation is through the spirit of unity that ties all Americans together. Once well, through unity, may we achieve equality. So together, I believe that the Republican, Democrats, and the progressives may yet carry the torch of civil rights not individually, but together. Bobby continued to give a short speech intermittently with Lyndon Johnson, as well as Governor of Texas John Connolly, for more than an hour. When the whole affair finished, and all attendees had shaken hands for unity or some such, Robert's throat was dry and sore, and his hand ached from the crushing grip of LBJ. He hoped to hop back in the jet. Uh, Black Continental with Vice President William Guy. Next up is... Alabama, he said. Wallace is going to give you crap. That's a given. Said guy, we could rub it in his face. Time to spread the gospel of civil rights. We don't need to rile up Wallace. Yeah. Is there a court practice? So, for quite a few days. Glass house. Bob Kenny lay reclined in his bed in what must have been the most expensive and lavish hotel room he'd ever seen. It's had everything a full bathroom, bigger than some inner city apartment, and a king size feather bed. Radio, mini fridge, and even a TV. Unfortunately, the TV only had a few channels, so Bobby chose the news as background noise while I read about the latest developments in Europe. Regardless, after a long day and giving fiery speeches in Montgomery, Alabama, it was nice to relax for a few minutes. It was quite the miracle he had the TV turn up at all, as he heard his name said. And tree, Bobby increased the volume. Governor Wallace claimed President RFK came to Alabama this week only to slander him in the entire state of Alabama. Wallace said that he had served the state of Alabama faithfully for many years and would not let a Yankee upstart with no political experience to tell him or his constituents how to live, or run or live their lives. Uh, he also said Kenny's trying to break with the unity of the MPP in the state of Alabama. Bobby turned off the TV, his lips curling into a frown. He expected and hoped for an outcome like this. This was just the opportunity to kick Walls down a couple notches. If Walls wanted to play ball, he should learn the simple truth. He's now a catcher in the House of Glass. We're so close. We have nothing. Strike one, you're out. Well, said William Guy, uh, letting Scar today could have gone a lot better. Bobby Kenny eyed him with a, uh, some annoyance. Well, when he walked out of those hotel tours that I expected press, he just never expected. Uh, Walls would be standing there with him, huh? Ready to talk over and humiliate you? you? Bobby <clears throat> nodded. He looked over the city of Knoxville, Tennessee, where they had stopped for the night. The wind on the hotel balcony they said was was strong, but it was balmy. It would have been perfect had it not been for the day's events. I couldn't get a word edgewise. Every time I opened my mouth, they would scream over me. He made me look like a gosh darn fool. I've already gotten calls from three party members, all from different wings. They asked me what the heck happened. I know, said guy. It was a rough business, especially when dealing with an animal like Wallace. Bobby sighed, watching the distant flashing lights of an airplane as it moved silently across the sky. It disappeared in the clouds only after a minute. Or a moment. Huh, Hugh, said Bobby. I've had enough. Let's go home. I want more political power so badly. Campaigns. Five, that's better than six, but right there, so. 
This game ten. Huh? Thirty-two, thirty-two point seven, one point five every month. Are you kidding me, bro? Bro. How are these guys not dead yet? We don't worry about this. Please go ahead. Okay, so we did win. Okay, thank God. France lands with Germany. Um, I think I've read this one before as well. So if you want to read this one, please go right ahead. Uh, serve with the side of Sambal. Remove all the discontent, which is actually, I'd say, really hurting us. Matter of malaise. Inscription, health, education, huh? Okay, page will be removed. We get 100 political power, thank God. And that'll be good. Awesome. They're not in the old fan, but they will hopefully soon be. Oh, yeah, the Republic of the Philippines, too. And they're in with us, too. It's awesome. Thank God we got the political power. Uh, remember the sea lion? Oh, we need to save command power for this one. Crap. Crap, 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 crap. Anti pack propaganda. I'm going to spend political power for that one. That'll be good. That would help us out. Oh, God. How's this going down here? Look at the pretty stationary. Not much has really happened. Um. I want to invest in the administration. I really do, but we don't have. Uh, okay, do it anyways. Do we get any more? Two point five three? No. The clink. Or we can build a safety net now too. It's going to cost us more, which I don't want it to cost more. War on poverty. Just make money for the people. I could use political power. I think we're this early. So if you're into this game, please go right ahead. The clink. The first and most glaring issue in America's blighted justice system is their prisons. We can America Americans be thrust into an abysmal pit of cruelty, depravity, and ironically hideous injustice. <clears throat> Our prisons are cages of torment and suffering when they should be a tool to reform and rehabilitate, rehabilitate convicts. And like everything else, it's worse if you're black. Our prisoners are torture chambers. Our prisons are torture chambers filled with people who have no right being there. This must change the word reform the nation's mechanisms of justice. We must bring justice to those without access to it and give those who are unjustly treated a second chance. What we have here is failure to communicate. Nice. At least you're home. This is all slowly going up, but happy October, everybody, as we're loading, loading, loading. Nice. Belarus in council. We need to get more political power there. Calamitous campaign, that's not good. Just increase the ability by 2%. Oh my god, it's so low. Hmm. Could use more command power, god dang it. I'll get this now anyway, 32.5. 40? How did they get 40? That's such cheats. The AI cheats so hard for this. I might go back and just redo this maybe after the end of this episode, maybe. We'll see. But we'll see. Ports of the poor. Power of a handshake. We got more political power, which is good. Reserve core practices. We're going to do that one next. Follow it up with underlying problem. Come to a pro. Let's go with uh, the ports of the poor. In New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and a hundred other cities, faded posters of smiling families and sunny days bestrew the grim, uh, grimy black walls marking the seedier parts of town. Cloister houses arranged in haphazard patches dwell under the shadow of glamorous and ritzy skyscrapers. Its inhabitants am am amble from work to home and work again. Thoughts filled with words of a rent and food and bills and nothing but. They have no pride, no hope, no future beyond the 30 days they have to left but to pay for the right to live. This is the downtrodden of America, the countless tired and poor who hang their heads low while it's a few fortunate hold theirs high. This country cannot have moved forward as one without its lowly. How fortunate it is then that their new government intends to them before all else. Trench of poverty speech. 
Why is it that in America, stretching from Atlanta to the Pacific, with all the resources that owing most of the continent will provide, that still have a class of people mired in absolute poverty? Why is it in a nation that makes any, many times more food in the richest farmlands on plant, this planet, so have people starving? Why is it that in a country with the grandest skyscrapers and all the land to build and grow communities, so have tens of thousands of homeless people? Why is it in a nation with the best schools and hospitals that even enemy leaders and send their children to study in or have their cancers cured, have a literacy at all of millions dying in pain and misery? <coughs> the simple fact is that far, far too long we've expected every American to lift themselves up, to climb up and out of the deep trench of poverty by their own merit, strengths, and abilities to join the American dream that we all share. System which we call a meritocracy and take such pride in has a great fall though. There's some people who, no matter how hard they work, how hard they struggle, no matter how much they save, how much careful they are with their health, are struck by the misfortune of fate, are cast down into that pit of despair, unable to scramble out in the White House. I see stories like these every day via letter and telegram, as I visit every state and city and country. It's a county. It's heartbreaking to want to help those that, although with little or no fault of their own, have been pushed into that trench of poverty. So instead, I say let's help those out that need it. Everyone in that deep dark hole that they were dumped into. Those that are sick, we should heal. Those who have been ma maimed, we should lift up. Those that are homeless, we should shelter. Those that are skipping by, we should give a helping hand. That is the goal of Social Security. Providing a baseline support for those that need it. Giving Americans, every American, a chance to live the dream. To reach out a hand, to, uh, hand down a ladder, but to pull everyone up from the trench of poverty. More security for the American family. A long way from home, Jean Kirkpatrick was used to hardship. She was used to tough conflict, uphill battles, and challenging odds. Heck, her entire geopolitical viewpoint. The Kirkpatrick Doctrine was predicated on struggle, so it made sense that she was expecting a better fight for Virginia's 10th Congressional District. She was expecting to have to fight tooth and nail against the Nationalist faction of the MPP's Joel Broyhill. This battle, of course, never came. She easily won. An overwhelming majority of voters chose her. Situated right outside Washington, D.C., Virginia's 10th Congressional District benefited from the progressiveness in her capital, in addition to having countless people work on the hill with living within it. Countless staffers of both the incumbent, the president's, president's party, and those opposed chose her as a ballot box. She provided a better choice or future for both Virginia and the country. There are two things that really swayed the vote, however, and made Kirkpatrick's victory assured, or rather two buildings, the Pentagon at the headquarters of the military in Langley, the headquarters of the CIA. Members of both groups voted overwhelmingly for Kirkpatrick. Seeing her values in line with their own, her staunch hawkishness and commitment to fighting fascism was something to be admired from the newest, greenest CIA agent to the highest general. Jean Kirkpatrick, or rather Congress Congresswoman Kirkpatrick, was elated but not surprised. She seen this as the only logical outcome. Although she expected a harder fight, she was just aware where she wanted to be, and she could continue moving things forward to show to how she wanted them. She couldn't rest on her laurels, not yet. Congresswoman Kirkpatrick had a million things to do, from meeting her colleagues to hiring employees. She'd been planning to be very busy, and she was. One thing for sure, she was no longer in Oklahoma. A blazing touch, and the results are in, and they're pretty much what we expected. Our Justice Committee's reports confirmed our suspicions that America's justice institutions are openly, completely corrupt and desperate in need of reform to curb the horrible practices they engage in. Our courts, it seems, have little to no integrity. Judges and jurors alike are horrified, horrifically prejudiced against uh, African Americans who are both found guilty more often to receive harsher sentences than whites on trial for the same crimes. Blacks are frequently denied their judicial rights promised to all in the Constitution and often hoodwinked for forced into confessing by racist cops intent on sending black men to prison for no reason other than for the color of their skin. The injustice perpetrated upon Americans by the very system meant to uphold its utterly disgusting and it's a total subversion of everything America stands for. We need to fix this and now. In America, Lady Justice is anything but blind. At times, she was blindfolded again. Wouldn't hurt to take away her sword either. The power of a handshake? Some gestures leave immeasurable impacts on in one's interactions with others. A handshake takes its place by among the most important in American culture by firmly clasping the hand of another and shaking it firmly, both establishing either status as the other's peer. With a simple handshake, a man announces to another his good intentions, his respect for their dignity, and his belief in their equal standing, which perhaps explains why our captains of industry never seem to shake hands with the workers they employ. Reaching out of this country twice bent requires actively establishing good faith in her part. If we aim to bridge the crevices of American society, then the government must take the first few steps towards building the paths across them. For the president, the mag magnitudinous task before him begins with a simple handshake. And also, we are doing better here now because of some punky stuff I did off screen. Because at this point, I don't really care um, if we have to cheat or not. But, you know, I try not to, but, you know, you never know. Especially when East Africa keeps wanting to fall apart. Also, here is the Senate results. Um, 21, 15, 28, 34. So overall, not bad. We did, we did cheat, get more. Republicans actually got one more too, um, and of course, uh, MPP got more too as well. So, 56 cheat. The AI cheats so hard for this. 46 is ridiculous. Dead reckoning. Willis rested in the chair. Uh, cup with a beer in his hand. The Abdujan bar was noticeably quiet, with the only exceptions being soft music from a radio and uh, conversation from drunken militiamen. Probably the locals conscripted to fight for the free French, of course. Um, the exhausted bartender cleaned up one of the shot glasses with a towel that looked like it was going to pick up off the street. Picked up off the street. Willis wondered when he'd been given an actual sign by Langley. As the man entered the bar, Willis looked up and recognized the man immediately. His informant had arrived. As Willis checked his watch, the man guided a duffel bag down his arm and sat on the floor and sat across from him. <clears throat> Willis could see a single drop of sweat rolling down his temple, not to mention how intense he looked, but it was his deal. What do you have for me this time, Kwamba? Uh, Willis said enthusiastically. 
Quan Ba sensed the disinterest in his voice and wondered if that changed with what he was about to show him. Leaning over and pulling the duffel back towards him, he pulled out a single manila folder and threw it on the, t- on the table. Quan Ba stared at it at Willis, who looked at the folder curiously. Something big is coming, Quan Ba finally began, a thick accent masking his anxiety. My friends in Cameroon military have not told me much, but they've told me that you should not play, downplay what is in that folder. Willis had down three malaria pills with his beer as Quan Ba spoke. Willis set his drink down, sighed, and opened the folder. Scanning through the papers in front of him, he assumed a more certain attitudes became clear to Quan Ba. Quan Ba. Quan Ba. Quan Ba was not exaggerating. Increasing troop movement, supply transporting, and guerrilla activity, just what the heck do they think they're doing? Quan Ba only shrugged, and Willis leaned back in his chair, puzzled. Blood in the water. We're doing okay with the economy. Just okay. Not great, but okay. A day for tears. Um, if you want to buy this, please, you're in. At this point, I don't think we need the Navy. So, probably a bad idea to do that, but oops. Hey, look at all that manpower we got back. Yeah, fix the economy. No, not really. Bolts the third nominates civil cabinet. Huh. Basic citizens income experiment. There wasn't a whole lot of fanfare when President Kennedy signed the executive order, and even less when the first thousand letters and the two hundred dollar checks inside were sent up by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to families in thirteen states and sixty eight communities across the nation. Uh, the instructions on the letter work simple. For the next four years, you'll be receiving the same amount of money every month. There's no cash, no requirements, no stipulations how you may spend this money. Bills, clothes, housing, or just save it. All was fine. And best of all, it would be tax free. The important thing was to keep track of what you did and spend it on. And at the end of every month, you, they would receive a phone call and an envelope with a short questionnaire to fill in to be mailed back. Soon the rumors began to spread that the government was just sending, giving money to random people, which quickly began to work its way back through the political grapevine, and soon the citizens' basic income experiment was exposed via the Washington Post. The president has defended the program in a White House press conference, stating his goal of the citizens' basic income was to provide a baseline, guaranteed income that would help the poorest Americans make ends meet. It was just a year-long try to see the results. The opposition has come up from two sides, Democrats and Nationals, who denounced government handouts to random people, which would be incredibly expensive, especially in the light of all other social security programs Bobby has been pushing. But there are some of the progressive Marxist caucus who say that RFK hasn't gone far enough. He should be paying them even more money to more people for longer. Based on the backlash, the president has to respond quickly. Boost payments. Be too expensive. Decentivizes the need to work. We're going to go radical. Expect of hunger. Bitter so the bit. War on poverty. West Africa escalates. The president prepared to sign the order. Which one was to commit more American forces to West Africa? It's a necessary decision, one that had been ultimately ine- in- inevitable, as reports have come in describing the continued escalation of the conflict. Provocation and retaliation over and over to the point where the cabinet, the military, and the president were certain that if they did not act, uh, then others would. They, would not afford, they could not afford for one side to gain an irreversible de- advantage, unless it was their own, of course. Congress had provided authorization for the operation framed as a defensive measure that in theory was intended to merely allow the American forces to protect their allies. In reality, everyone knew what it meant. As a dedicated intervention, and one that the president hoped that the majority of the public would be prepared to support, no one wanted to think about what would happen if victory wasn't achieved relatively quickly or if the public backlash was swift. There was another element that needed to be considered as well, namely how the Japanese would respond. Given that they were likely watching America and would proportionally respond, many expected that Japan would soon follow suit and conduct their own intervention in Africa. Once more, Japanese and American soldiers would meet on the field of battle, the world could only help it remain to confined in West Africa. May the best nation win. Country pool. War on poverty. The president's return from his tour across the nation, while made for good PR opportunities, is disquieted by the sheer level of poverty encountered in some of the most destitute parts of America. Now that we can claim to be a superpower where our own citizens endure such grueling hardships is appalling. As long as there's plenty, poverty is evil, and the president will make absolutely sure that his office will dedicate itself to the eradication of poverty in our great country. Yeah. Fifth, what the frick? I mean, this is stupid. Yeah, this needs to be reworked. This whole new Atlantic Alley thing needs to be heavily reworked, because that's ridiculous. There's no way we can compete against that, man. Man, bro, we're gonna continue fighting up against poverty too, because right now we want to get that lower too. Uh, free pass looking. It's looking okay. Three divisions. We'll send you then. Um, not sure how much they have. So each of us should hold. Cast, cast, fighters. Can we send them here? No. Well, we can't send planes. Oh, god dang it. it kind of sucks. But, uh, which hand to shake? That was a good question to ask. Whose hand are we shaking? Alright. Oh, it's a mess down here. But when is it not a mess, you know? Yeah, it's a mess, 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 mess. Let's clean this area up first around here. And just let them go. Have fun. Do what you need. Actually, can we send, can we send you planes? God, walk, walk. That's still like, that seems a bug if we get some planes. Nothing down there we really care about. Remember sea line. Increase it by two every month, huh? 
Just by one. Oh. West Africa. I'm not going to invest in West Africa at all. Uh, battleships. Yes. Wow. Well, that definitely helped out for years plus, but getting rid of the navy, but still. Nuclear stockpiles, army expenditures. Huh. Falgor home. Inflation is pretty darn high, too. Oh. Power of handshake, though. What chance to shake? Give me your tired, give me your poor. Fit our food banks. Contrary pool, as always with the shows of media major uh, major media outlets. I think we started off, ladies and gentlemen. In tonight's show, we'll be speaking with Miss Phyllis Schlafy, a prominent conservative foreign policy specialist. Thank you for joining us, Miss Schlafy. Out of the usual pleasantries, a host got a business, Miss Schlafy. We'd like to hear for your views on the recent decision to send troops into West Africa. Schlafy was poised, pleasant, and sure in conviction, so the showrunner would later recall. Her reply came quickly and bluntly. I will be honest with you, I failed to see any possible reason for the United States to involve itself in some piddling little conflict between socialists, exiled Frenchmen, and unorganized African tribes that gained us nothing in return. What exactly does America lose if the Japanese tie themselves to some feckless communists? Both were mildly surprised. Surely there's some merit in preventing Japanese incursions in any region of the world. Surely General de Gaulle has some legitimacy in resisting the pan Africanist onslaught. But the guests didn't back down, retorting, no, there's no merit in that. Certainly not in comparison to preventing domestic fascist and communist incursions. Furthermore, there's no reason whatsoever that American boys should give up their lives for Charles de Gaulle's restoration as fantasies. Absolutely not. All that host simply changed their topic. At that, at least. Which hand to shake? The President. And his allies have been stumping around the nation for weeks now, rallying support for his expansive social security program, slowly moving the needle in favor of his proposals. Each speech from the big auditoriums of the cities of the small stages of county fairs convinces more and more people that the plan, while big and bold, will undoubtedly help millions of Americans that need it. In Cleveland, Ohio, as Bobby Kennedy climbs off the stage after giving another speech in the public auditorium, uh, he's greeted by a huge crowd of supporters and well wishers as Secret Service agents keep out a nervous eye. Aides hurry up to follow the president, and news photographers and reporters from local newspapers and from the Associated Press hustle up to get a good shot as he begins to glad hand the crowd. It was a later group that Bob had found the most concerned about, as the picture that they took would be printed in newspapers around the country, therefore. Even before he walked on the stage to give a speech, he was discussing with his advisors what to do when he was done. It was important that he got to the right look, the right message across on who he would be the first to shake hands with. Undoubtedly, the most Im likely image would be seen tomorrow morning from the coast to coast. Should he shake hands with the man in the crowd with a national button pinned to his chest? An average Joe showed that he was willing to work with his entire party. Or perhaps the head of the Cleveland chapter of the D NAACP, show the strong bond that RFK has with the African American community. Or maybe he had the head of the Typographical Workers' Union Local 53, which is one of the oldest unions in the city, to show solidarity with the working class. It's been in the back of the president's mind from the moment he started his speech, and now that with a fraction of a second, second to think, he stretches his hand out to thank Nationalist Joe, left liberal, NAACP, lose support, Typographical Workers' Union, Leadership approval. It seems less liberal. Lose support. I don't want to lose any support. Um, you want Romney here too? Uh, we'll, do, we'll do Cole until Pro. And we'll do whatever we can to make sure that he loses. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I don't know. We're too successful here. We won't be able to elect George Romney too, but eh, maybe we will. We'll see. Hmm. Go with that one. There are food banks. There's more than enough food in the country to feed the people, but there are many who simply cannot afford to feed themselves and their family. While well, these people struggle just to get enough to sustain themselves through the day, it is impossible to, for them to spend any time trying to improve themselves. Most established food banks provide for the most destitute among us so that we might have a chance of pulling themselves out of poverty. We can source donations of food from the generous Americans and grant federal funding to buy out excess stock from stores and supply centers. Ultimately, we must ensure that nobody goes to bed on an empty stomach. Form the Job Corps. I have an efficiency it just gets worse and worse. An age old paradox, one needs experience to find work, but also needs work to get experience. Tell me about it. My god, it sucks. Our youth know the struggle best of all as they are forced to end to end into dead end jobs <clears throat> and provide no room for self improvement. We shall establish an organization that will offer training and work experience for young adults across the country. Not only will this improve the career prospects of a young workforce, it will also fill the market with the wealthy or wealth of newly skilled laborers, which will provide a much needed boost to local economies. Which would be great. Alright, so we're here. We definitely want that one. Yeah. Two every month, we're at three every month. God dang it. Uh, looking okay now here, even though East Africa is still going down a little bit. God dang it. Which also plays those mandates as well. Yeah. Admin costs will rise, but we definitely don't want to have uh, this hurting us too much. The war on poverty. Surplus, not enough. Inflation is critical. Oh god. Um. Or the presses, counter pennies. 
Oh, that's gonna hurt growth. Yeah, inflation is really freaking high. The war on poverty. Or on the Jobs Corps. How can America be called the greatest nation in the world when millions of our citizens are drowned in abject squalor across the nation, children starve, workers are paid a pittance, the whole community slipped through the cracks? It's imperative that we break the cycle of poverty and let our poor and disposed out of that dark abyss. As a ruler, duty as rulers, as fellow Americans, ensure that all of the people can rise out of poverty and be provided with the opportunities they need to pursue happiness. On his journey across America, President Kennedy has seen poverty as no other politician has. Children starving in Mississippi, farm workers treated like slaves in California, blacks across the South living under destitution. Sell it all beyond the proper face of these many sell uh, shame, desperation, and resignation. Sell the emptiness of the children's eyes, eyes which had the light had long ago guttered out and thought of his own children. Those images of pain and degradation remained with him, consuming his walking thoughts, waking thoughts, haunting his dreams. He knew he had to do something, for whenever he closed his eyes, he saw those dark, shrunken faces crying out for the Savior. But Rome was not built in a day. The president knew that his internal consternation that poverty was, like everything else, twisted into a political issue by the cruel vipers of Washington. The aid of Wallace and his cronies would be vital to the success of his first salvo of anti-poverty legislation. But would their support be worth the price? Concessions were good and good. Greatly angered the more hawkish members of MVP. Spend 1.25. Hmm. Further divided? Sure. More debt? Oh boy. That's why we tax them high. History maker. Uh, I think I read this one before. That's a symbol of progress for New England. If you want to read about this, please go ahead. Affordable House Housing Act. To Americans, a house is not simply a refuge from the elements. It will to providing warmth or storehouse for the prized possessions. A house is their castle, which wedge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they feel most secure than anywhere else on earth. A house is their domain, its walls marking the balance upon where upon their words absolute law. A house is their symbol, and with many they declare, and with it they declare to the world that they are free men, beholden to none but the government. Strip an American in this house. It becomes a little more than a slave. <clears throat> Excuse me. What does it say of today's America that most of the citizens do not have the money to buy a house of their own? The Progressive Caucus has long been aware of this problem and have drafted a bill designed to encourage the construction of affordable housing projects in America's booming cities. <coughs> Soon every American will own a castle, but that is in that far, far future. Instead, we can contend ourselves for having guaranteed that future as soon as President Kennedy signs into law. I apologize about my voice near here, here at the end. Oh, God. Opening the door of opportunity. Uh, so many Americans spend their lives uh, floundering in poverty, desperate to better their situation by lacking the resources to make it happen today. Too many. If we left them out of poverty, we need to help them develop skills and attributes, attributes to gain, find gainful employment. Training they otherwise would never have been able to afford. The solution, the Job Score, a new program run by the Department of Labor, aimed at providing young, low-income Americans with free vocational training to improve the quality of life by giving them the skills they need to bear their own socioeconomic standing. With the advent of the Job Score, we'll be able to show America's indignant millions a path out of the darkness of poverty, where a brighter future awaits whoever is willing to make it theirs. A brighter day drawn, dawns. Cool. But I think we're going to end it there. Um, I hate this thing so much. Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, let's see, anti-back propaganda. Six, how do, you can't compete. You literally cannot compete with that. That's ridiculous. Command power, political power. Up to two max. Up to two max. 1.5. 33% chance, 33% chance. We can spend the political power because command power is much more precious right now. But yeah, I think I'm going to end it there for now as we'll see what we can do um, in the next episode. But if you enjoyed the video, despite my coughing, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you what else we can do with RFK. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.